Welcome back to Bargaining 101. I'm William Spaniel, and today's topic is the market for lemons. You can read more about this in Chapter 7 of Game Theory 101 Bargaining. Check the video description for more information about that. Previously in this unit on uncertainty, parties have known the exact value of the object they are bargaining over. Instead, the uncertainty was over what happens when bargaining failed. That might mean whether the labor union is capable of weathering a strike or not, or whether I have the ability to get a high-paying job if I leave your company when you and I are negotiating a pay raise for just me. However, it's not always true that parties know the exact value of the bargaining object. It may be that I know more about it than you do, when you and I are trading that good. The classic example of this is used cars. The title of this lecture is The Market for Lemons, and if you're familiar with the car markets, you might know that a lemon is a vehicle that just doesn't function properly. So that's why it gets this name, The Market for Lemons. In a market for used cars, the owner of the vehicle has a much better idea about the condition of that car than a potential buyer does. I know whether that car has been in accidents, I know whether it has been repaired frequently, and whether it's been maintained properly throughout its entire history, and you don't really know that. You can maybe take my word for it, maybe you can ask for proof and verification of these things, but the bottom line is that I have a much better idea about what's going on with that vehicle than you do. And what we're going to see is that when we have this type of uncertainty, massive inefficiency can result. We've seen before that uncertainty can cause inefficiency, but this is a lot worse. What we're going to see here in this example is a complete breakdown in the trade market, even though if uncertainty were revealed, if all information were revealed, we would have a lot of efficient trade going on. And in contrast, all trade just disappears here. And that's different from the previous breakdowns of bargaining that we've seen with other types of uncertainty, where at least some deals were being made in those circumstances. Here, we're going to see no deals being made at all. But before I get into the model, I want to give you a little bit of intellectual history on this. It's actually kind of fascinating. Uh, the project, The Market for Lemons, is actually a paper. You can go read it online. A uh, quick Google search will uncover that for you. This won George Akerlof the Nobel Prize in 2001. So this is a big deal. In 2001, the Nobel Prize Committee on Economics decided to recognize a bunch of scholars who dealt with incomplete information and economics, and Akrilov is one of those people. We're going to see another paper that won a Nobel Prize in a couple of lectures. This paper, The Market for Lemons, has 23,000 plus citations on Google Scholar. That's a ton of citations. And in fact, it's about 8,000 more than it had just a couple of years ago. So people are still citing this, despite the fact that it's decades old at this point. And uh, as a final note, for those of you who might be struggling academics who are watching this lecture, the Market for Lemons paper was rejected three times from peer-reviewed journals for being either trivial or incorrect. So just because someone is telling you right now that your paper is wrong, or it's unnecessary and it's stupid, know that you two are still capable of winning a Nobel Prize. And maybe if you don't know who George Akerlof is, you might know his wife. His wife is Janet Yellen. She's the chairman of the Fed. Okay, so fun facts aside, let's get to understanding why this is a big innovation and why this is an important thing to know. Why do we care about the market for lemons? Well, let's think about this used car example again. Imagine that Barbara is trying to sell her car to Albert. Barbara knows the true quality of the vehicle. She owns it, she's been driving it around for many, many years. She knows whether this is a good car or not. Albert, however, only has some vague idea about whether the car is good or not. He speculates that one third of the time, the car is what we call a peach. It's a wonderful vehicle that's been well conditioned and there's nothing wrong with it. Under these circumstances, if the car is a peach, Albert values it at $5,000, and Barbara values it at $4,500. So Albert needs a car more than Barbara does, which is why he's willing to buy it at a higher price than the minimum that Barbara needs to sell it. And notice that these prices here are relatively valuable to reflect the fact that the car is a peach. It's in good condition. What's interesting to note here is that if this information were known, if it were known to Albert that the car was a peach, then we would have an efficient agreement being made between Albert and Barbara. Albert values that car more than Barbara does, 
And so Albert should be able to reach an agreement with Barbara that exchanges the car, Albert pays some money to Barbara, and both parties are better off as a result of that. But Albert doesn't know that information, right? He only thinks a third of the time that the car is a peach. Another third of the time, he thinks that the car is average. Under these circumstances, the car isn't as valuable to either Albert or Barbara, so now Albert values it at most at $2,500, and Barbara would need at least $2,000 to sell it. So Barbara needs less money to be willing to sell the vehicle under these circumstances, and Albert's maximum price is lower as well. Notice again that if all information were revealed, if Albert knew Barbara's car was in fact average, they should be able to negotiate an agreement here as well that leaves them both better off. The last third of the time is the problem. In this case, the car is a lemon. Albert now finds this vehicle to be completely worthless, he values it at zero dollars, and Barbara, for you know some sentimental reason, whatever, she values it at some very, very small amount, one hundred dollars in this case. So notice here that one third of the time, if information were revealed, then Albert would know the car is a lemon and we wouldn't have any agreements taking place because Albert doesn't want that vehicle. He values it at an amount less than what Barbara values it at. So here we wouldn't expect trade, but we should see trade in those other two circumstances. And what we're going to see, though, is that because there's this uncertainty and because there's this possibility that the car is a lemon, all of the bargaining, all of the negotiations, all of the deals will break down and we'll see no trade happen whatsoever. Why is that? Well, let's think about what happens if Albert were to pursue a naive bargaining strategy. What I mean by that is he's not thinking about whether Barbara would actually be marketing the car to him and trying to sell the car to him under uh, conditional circumstances, whether the car is a peach, whether it's average or a lemon. Just imagine that Albert thinks that Barbara is always going to offer the vehicle to him. Well, then at most, he would be willing to offer his expected value for that vehicle. So a third of the time he believes it's a peach and he values that car at $5,000. A third of the time he believes that car is average and would be willing to pay up to $2,500. And a third of the time he would be not wanting to pay anything for it because he believes it's a lemon. So in expectation, the most Albert should be willing to offer for the vehicle is $2,500. That's just the weighted average of those three prices. But think about what happens if Albert, at most, would only be willing to offer $2,500 for the vehicle. Who's going to accept that offer? Well, if the car is a peach, Barbara needs a price at least $4,500 to be willing to sell it. Barbara knows that it's a good, reliable vehicle, and so she wouldn't want to part, part with it for such a small price. That means Albert's naive offer is insufficient. So if he were to make a naive offer like that, he should not expect an agreement from a vehicle owner who has a peach. So now imagine that Albert wises up a little bit and he pursues a slightly less naive bargaining strategy. So he recognizes that the peach owner will not be willing to accept his offer under those circumstances. Well, then, at most, he would be willing to offer the weighted average of what remains. So if we know that the car isn't going to be sold if it's a peach, then half of the remaining time the car is average, and half of the remaining time the car is a lemon. So now, if we take the weighted average of Albert's prices, the most he's willing to pay under those circumstances, well, he's willing to pay $2,500 in the first case, where the car is average, and he's willing to pay nothing in the second case, and so, on average, in expectation, the most he should be willing to pay is $1,250. Well, who's going to accept under those circumstances? If the car is a peach, Barbara still needs a price of $4,500 to sell. If the car is average, Barbara needs a price of at least $2,000 to sell. And so, in both of those circumstances, where Albert is now offering $1,250 for the vehicle, the peach owner and the average owner is unwilling to sell the vehicle for those prices. Obviously, the peach owner doesn't want to sell because the car is really nice. And now the average owner, the car is average. If you're a Barbara, you don't want to sell that vehicle because you're still getting a very small price for a car that is okay. And it's not worth parting at such a small amount of $1,250. So what does that mean? Well, that means only the lemon owner is still willing to sell for that price. But Albert doesn't want to purchase a lemon. If he knows that the vehicle is a lemon, he would rather just not buy the vehicle at all. And so the presence of the lemon here means that no transactions take place. 
even though if information were to be revealed, Albert would be able to uh, buy the car from Barbara if the car were a peach, and also be able to buy the car from Barbara if it were to be an average vehicle. So the lack of information here massively destroys the trading market for this vehicle. Now, in the book, I talk a little bit more about the ways people have tried to solve these problems, but one solution that you've probably heard of that's pretty common in the United States is Carfax. You've heard the expression, show me the Carfax, right? That's their slogan. This, this video is not actually paid for by Carfax, but they have a good business plan here, and I want to show and demonstrate why that's the case. A Carfax report gives the history of a used car. So if you've ever been involved in the used car market, you've probably experienced this before and you've probably seen what a Carfax looks like. It has a detailed report of everything that's been wrong with the vehicle over a long period of time. So if the car has been into an accident, it will have some detailed descriptions about when that accident took place, what was damaged, and what had to be replaced. So when you're in the market for a used car, when you're trying to buy a used car, it's actually very important that you get that Carfax. Because if you don't get that Carfax, then you have no idea what's going on, and you're in this situation where you have to do this naive bargaining strategy, and that may end up leading you to a point where no one is going to want to sell you their vehicle unless that vehicle is a lemon. But this also has an implication for you if you're trying to sell your vehicle. If you're trying to sell your vehicle and you have a very good vehicle, then you should be showing a Carfax report because you want to demonstrate to the buyer of the vehicle, the potential buyer of the vehicle, that you have a very nice car. But this also means that if you have an average vehicle, you still want to demonstrate that you have an average vehicle by showing the Carfax once again. Because if you weren't to show the Carfax, then the potential buyer of the car would have to think about whether you have an average vehicle or a lemon, and it's still better to reveal the fact that you have an average vehicle and not have this possibility that you have a lemon. So if you encounter a situation where someone is just refusing you to show the Carfax, there's a safe bet there that the car is in fact a lemon and they're deliberately trying to hide that information from you because they want to try to trick you into buying a car for a price that is not actually worth it. So show me the Carfax, make sure you have that market for lemons breakdown and you have the information in front of you that you need to be able to make a good, wise, smart, not naive deal. That wraps up this lecture, and join me in the next time when we get to another classic paper in the field of information and bargaining. Take care.